Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We got a great show today, got an interesting European Open to discuss, and we've got a great cast as well. I'm really excited about this one. Brody, you're here, man of the people. What's going yeah. on in the comments? Yep. yep. Uh, a couple things here first before we jump into the comments. Uh, not to throw shade at, on any of the other contestants, but I am a little sad that Hunter isn't here. Uh, not only did he have one of the worst takes ever on this last episode, and I'll show you the comments to prove that, uh, he also very quickly decided to not bring up anything he said in the text messages after Ricky lost the European Open. It was very surprising the change of tune that he had on Grip Locked, where he wasn't mentioning anything about choking, anything about that. Uh, and I, I would love for him to come on here and explain that, but. I guess we're not going to get it. Um, with that being said, man of the people looked at the comments. Uh, here are the top comments. I'll travel four hours to play a new course before I drive an hour to watch live disc golf. Hunter was straight tripping on that point. Brody was right about people not wanting to drive hours and hours to watch. Hey, finished person here. I wouldn't drive six hours to go watch disc golf. Another person. I love disc golf, but I'm not driving more than an hour for a PDGA tournament. I'm six hours south of Maple Hill. There is 0% chance that I drive to watch the MVP open. And then the final one in the kicker, Brody never gets enough points, makes the best points, but most of the time gets lower points than the rest that make the most generic points. Sounds like you have a really good fan base. I think that's what my would observe. <laughs> I just read the comments, man. I just read man, the comments. Man of man of the Brody's fan base. Um, <laughs> Steven is joining us. Uh, been a while since Steven's been on the show. Back from the West Coast. Yeah, hey guys. Um, excited to be back. Uh, I've seen a mix of comments about myself on the ones that I've been on. So uh, hopefully I can uh, redeem myself and get back to my winning ways from last season. Well, just say things like Brody should get more points and Brody has the best points and they'll love you. They'll love you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Good point, Brody. Yeah, uh, Mike is that returning. That won't be the first time he's sat on the show tonight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, Mike is returning after his debut victory last week, uh, looking to defend. Yeah, I thought about just never coming back for that 100% victory, but I had to come back, try to go back to back. My sleep schedule is still a little messed up from watching every single throw from all of the European content, so Jeez. I'll do my best. Wow. Yeah, that is dedication for sure. Um, and then Gary is back again. Um, this is this will be your first encounter with 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 Mike, the new champ. So going to be an yeah. interesting battle here. I think it was a good thing that he said, you know, that we should start last week to bring people back after they win because I wasn't available a lot earlier this year to do that. So, yeah, you know, ready to, ready to throw down. But hey, great, great first time showing for Mike. Um, well, listen to this. I actually want to, I want to bring this up before we jump into the show, Brody, this will play kind of into what you just mentioned, but I had an idea before the show. I was, I was telling these guys about it. Let me know in the comments below if this interests you as a viewer. So we already produce this show as kind of a live product, even though it's not broadcasted live. Um, and people always have input on, you know, who they thought did better or whatnot. Fair enough. Right. That's kind of the purpose of the show. Obviously I'm just one judge. So what if we were to broadcast this show live on YouTube and let you hand out the points via voting in the chat? Would that interest you? Do you think that would be a fun way to consume the show? Let me know in the comments down below. I don't know. What do you think, Brody? Does Sias have, have the technology for that? Oh, we could just do it via the YouTube chat. Just put out a poll. How many points does Brody earn for turn one? Oh. And then just vote on it. Oh, that'd be fun. Um, yeah. This, I think this show as a, a live show would be absolutely electric. The chat yeah. would be going nuts. Yeah, it could be yeah. interesting. So let me know um, if that interests you in the comments down below. And maybe maybe late this season we test it out, or and maybe if it works out, that, that could be debate night season three could could go live. We'll see because wouldn't really be much extra effort. I think it could be a cool product, and you don't have to deal with me. Um, just just absolutely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just 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 robbing Brody <laughs> of his victories at this point. Uh, let's get into the first topic, though. We're going to talk about the European Open. So I want to know from you, which is a bigger deal? Gannon winning his second major at age 19, mind you, in his first start at the European Open, um, or Ricky squandering yet another opportunity to end his major drought? What is the bigger deal? Brody Smith. I mean, I think this one's pretty simple. I, I, I feel like if Ricky would have played poorly that final round, I, I think we could have maybe made an argument for 
Ricky squandering as as the bigger story, the bigger deal. But I mean, Ricky played incredible. He he did literally everything he could. And um, aside from the fact that you know, hole eighteen, there's these kind of random trees throughout the fairway, and he just so happened to land in front of one. Uh, very unfortunate, but it happens. Uh, that was really the only thing that was stopping this from going into a playoff. I thought Ricky played uh, very, very well. Um, little surprise on him laying up on 15. I know that was his game plan and that's what he was doing in previous rounds and in practice rounds. But in that situation, I would have liked to have seen him maybe go for that. Uh, but other than that, I thought he played phenomenal. Um, the big story here is Gannett. Uh, I actually kind of forgot that he was 19. At this point in time, it kind of almost feels like he's in that 21, 22, 23. The way that he's kind of ha- handling himself on the course as well. Obviously, he does have, you know, if you follow him on social media, he's still like a goofy little 19-year-old. I get that. But the way he's able to kind of manage his game is, is very surprising uh, at that age. And I, I think the real question, you know, right here is, is how good can he get? That that's yeah. the real question. I think he I think he's not at his peak just yet as far as his ceiling goes. Yeah, he he has unlimited potential right now. It's it's been insane. I'm also very anti random tree in the fairway as well. I think that's ridiculous. Um, Steven, what are your thoughts? Which is the bigger deal? Uh, well, I'm not going to say anything about the random tree in the fairway because I don't want to upset Trevor. Um, but uh, it is known, uh, in my opinion, the disc golf world knows that current iteration of Ricky cannot win a major. Um, It's just fact at this point, it's not going to happen. He's just not going to do it. So, and everybody knows that Gannon is the second coming of the sport. Um, In my opinion, it's a much bigger deal for Gannon. He's young, he's hungry, he's ice cold when it matters. Uh, We are only a world's and a champion's cup away from a grand slam. And he's only 19. His ceiling is through the roof at this point. Um, I I got people calling me, telling me how great he is. And he shows that he is able to consistently finish at the top of the game. I only predict that it's going to get better for Gannon. I think he will be the only modern era player to rival Paul and Climo in the major wins category. And I think he can do it. Um, So he's definitely the bigger story. Yeah, he's certainly setting a, a quite an interesting pace getting wins this early. It feels like it's so funny, the 19 thing. I don't know if anybody remembers, but when Jason Tatum was getting coming into the league in the NBA, everybody's saying was he's only 19. Even when he was like 23, they still said he's only 19. So I feel like that's going to be Gannon's thing. We're just going to keep keep going with that. Uh, Mike, what did you think? Gannon, Ricky, which is the bigger deal? I want to address, like you mentioned, just being 19. There's something just beautifully weird and funny about – I saw it during President's Cup. He was screaming, I got alcohol. I got alcohol just being an absolute goober and then going around and turning around and just being a, a just a stone cold killer in the event. So like the fact that he's 19 and doing this is insane. As far as Ricky goes, I have mixed feelings. I mean, he obviously played amazing for 17 holes. He had an unfortunate lie on his um, second shot. It's not a shot he can't do, um, but we already know he hasn't finished ma- great at majors lately, so I'm not really thinking that's the issue here, or the story, rather. The story is Gannon. I mean, at 19 years old, he's showing so much poise, so much uh, performing under pressure, better than anyone in the world. The fact that he was able to make make that putt after going out of bounds on 17, staying calm, and birding the next hole, Just you, we've seen so many people spiral after things like that. And even back to hole 16, where Ricky had just parked it, and he gets a time warning violation. So for the the rest of the tournament, he's got that in the back of his head. And say what you want about him being slow, that would affect anybody knowing in the back of your head you have to hurry up. So the fact that he parked that and just did everything right after that, it was just incredible. I mean, we've seen him come back and chase someone down at a major at USDGC. Now we see him holding off two of the two best players of all time, one of which having a a most amazing round we've ever seen at that course. It's just incredible what he's doing. I I don't want to harp on Ricky too much because he did play great round. The story here is Gannon and just how incredible he's playing at such a young age. Yeah, a great shout out for his, you know, his composure. I think there were multiple moments, you know, uh, 
firstly being the the missed par putt you know he's got somebody in the crowd i guess the story is coughing while he's putting whatever you know then you mentioned the time warning and then the late mishap as well with the roll away there was multiple times that he could have crumbled and i feel and it just just never happened he was able to keep his composure very impressive um gary so it seems like everybody's kind of decided on this are you leaning a similar direction or are you putting a little more heat on rick yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, the DGN definitely got their ideal lead card showdown for their pay-per-view model. I mean, what more could you ask for? You got the 19-year-old at the top of the sport right now. You got the man who's in his seventh year since his last major, the GOAT and best European Open player ever with Paul, and the best European player on the tour standing right now. So this card went 41 down in the final round, which was the highest of any other card. It was only 33 down with the next round. Ricky put down an absolutely next level round where both times Gannon bogeyed, he picked up the birdie. So he was definitely chasing and he had that triple Turkey streak in the middle getting the nine in the row. Um, and he only had really one blemish, which was pulling that shot wide on 18. I mean, the, the lie was tough. Yeah. On any other weekend, I think that it may have been enough, but unfortunately we're not going to see a European open win at the beast for Ricky. The ultimate story here was definitely Gannon's win, but more importantly, it's how he won because in one singular day, Gannon set the course record at Tampada, leading the field in birdie rate and C1 and C2 in regulation. And then that afternoon, casually set another course record at the Beast, leading the field in birdie rate, scramble percentage, park percentage, C1X putting, and strokes gained T to green. But the greatest feat of all was his final round when he had to square off against two of the best chasers to ever play the sport. Ricky had to shoot a course record, spectator coughing during his stroke. He was put in a time clock. He's got the mind of a 19-year-old, and he's never played the event before. And none of yeah. that mattered. And his putt on hole 13 said everything. 45 feet, check. Slope behind the basket, check. Green means go. And his name is uh, Gannon Burr because uh, he's cold as ice. So, Burr. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, good to mention, yeah, that, you know, say what you want about that final round, but that you know, that day of disc golf where he had two course records in one day, like that, that is one of the most insane tournament performances. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, that, that DJ and uh, lead carb is crazy. And just the fact that he had those guys behind him that are like, I'm sure he has watched growing up and are like, are, are scary to have chasing you. I mean, Rick makes that Eagle early in the day. He's never letting up at any point, you know, if you slip, you're in trouble. Um, it's an, it's an incredible performance. Uh, I, I think the, the Rick thing is almost drawn on long enough now that people are kind of numb to it. And I, I do agree that obviously the biggest uh, nod in his favor, though he didn't play well enough early in the event, uh, you know, that final round, he did everything he could realistically. Mm -hmm. I think things would look a lot differently had he had the lead and, and, and lost it or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. Can't and one additional thing, too, is. You know, I, I was talking, I was kind of leading the charge last year about how Calvin's season last year was so impressive of how consistent he was, even though he wasn't winning all the time, just how consistent yeah. he was. You look at Gannon's season this year, it's similar. very similar, but he's winning more. Yeah. And then you could be thinking like, oh, well, he's just having an incredible season. Go back and look at what he's done the last four years, like four mm -hmm. years, and you start looking at his body of work. And it is very, very impressive. And sometimes it gets kind of, I think, brushed under the rug a little bit because we have so many other kind of flashy new toys coming on tour. Uh, but yeah, what he's doing right now is very impressive. There are a few. That, go ahead. Not only that, but he's having fun while doing all this. Like, it's amazing how he's been able to find a balance between when he steps on the course, he turns on that mode. But off the course, he's still able to have a good time with his friends. Like, he's proving that, hey, you can come be on the tour have a good time, grind, and still make wins. Like, he's living the best of his life right now. Yeah. Guys figured out disc golf. And there's few mm -hmm. players that you can look at. And when Gannon's at his most confident level and he's at his most locked in, he feels like he can do anything with the disc. And it shows because he, any shot that's demanded of him, he just makes it happen. Um, he, he's got incredible control. And uh, yeah, he looks very dangerous for years to come. He's going to be, he's going to be the guy to beat. Uh, you know, potentially for the next five, six years. Um, all right, on to the next topic. So on the flip side of things, we had the MPO division, then we had the FPO division. European Open was uh, happening during the very early hours of the morning, at least over here on the East Coast. And um, it was quite a roller coaster. So I want to know, what was your perception of the FPO division during the European Open? Do you find the chaotic swings on the leaderboard to be entertaining and fresh or annoyingly unpredictable? And then also, was this a bigger Kristen win or Evelina loss? Um, what's your perspective, Steven? 
Um, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that um, if we could keep the dogs quiet uh, in the gallery while I'm doing my answer, that'd be great. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, I love the swings back and forth. Uh, it shows us that, in my opinion, though, it shows us that FPO needs an infusion of consistency among its top players. We've seen these the FPO really be dominated by one or two people for the majority of seasons year in and year out when you had Paige and Katrina going back and forth. And then you have Kristen come onto the scene and she's the main person. I mean, we have seen a bit more fluctuation in winners this year, mostly because Kristen's been hurt. Um, but she is the standard. Her greatness is magnified due to the inconsistency of the field. Um, to me, though, this is just another notch in Kristen's belt. It's another trophy in her case. And by the way, great, great trophy for the European Open. Great trophy. Um, Evelina is the bigger story. Her squandering such a massive lead. I know that people will look at her and say, oh, it's her putting. It's this. It's that. She always does this. But she had such a lead going into this course at the Beast where she, it is somewhere that her power can come in handy. She is a great thrower of the disc, and this is a thrower's course in my opinion, and I think that her squandering that lead, especially coming down the stretch in the last nine holes, and it looked like on a few of them she was just giving up at that point, and it, it's unfortunate. I want to see Evelina do well. I think a lot of us want to see Evelina and Henna do well, which she's not even in the conversation at this point, but I, I think that her mental lapses and her putting it's the bigger story. Can it get better? Will it get better? And will we ever see somebody step up to Kristen as far as the consistency is concerned? I think Silva could have the capability to do it. Um, but e Evelina was the bigger story. And, and I guess the lack of uh, a competitor to go against Kristen is the story, in my opinion. Yeah, certainly doesn't help when you're known as a thrower and don't even throw the disc well. That that never helps for sure. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts on the uh, FPO crazy events that took place? Well, first off, I, I do want to point out, Evelina did only have a three-stroke lead going into the final round. Granted, it wasn't to the person that ended up winning, but it's not like she had a huge lead. She still had quite a bit of pressure to play well. And I want to just start off by saying it it's not fun to watch professionals struggle like this, in my opinion. Like if someone stalls out and gets chased down, it's exciting, like bogey or double bogeying a hole or something like that. But when someone just has absolute meltdowns, it just makes it feel less professional. It's not just not as engaging to me, in my opinion, when it's that much of a train wreck. Um, I know the question kind of worded it differently, but I actually think FPO is annoyingly predictable, which is how much Chris, better Kristen is than everyone else. And Evelina did shoot nine over, but you have to realize that she still could have shot two over or three over and Kristen still would have came back and two or three over in this course really isn't that bad of a round. When you can look at other players last year, um, other than Kristen, the hot round was even or one over maybe one under every round. So like two or three over wouldn't have been that bad. And Kristen still would have came back and won this event. The fact that she can beat, I think Silva and Missy who didn't have a blow up round and actually played pretty consistent and well, the whole event the fact that she can beat them with that bad of a round just shows how many miles ahead she is of the field. So I'm not going to go after Evelina on this. Obviously, it was a terrible round, but I think this just shows that Kristen can not play an entire round and still beat this field still. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, certainly gave everybody a bit of a head start before <laughs> climbing back to the top of the leaderboard. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts on, on FPL? You know, I feel like anytime someone comes back from a seven stroke deficit to win, it's got to be entertaining and you kind of can't characterize it as annoying. Likewise, I think people can't help but look at Rex on the side of the road and Kristen's third and Evelina's fourth round. That's a different kind of entertainment, but it's still entertainment in some way, shape or form. And that may have been one of the worst rounds we've ever seen from Kristen. I mean, she was bottom or tied uh, for the bottom in five major stat categories. And I wish I could say that Evelina's poor fourth round was a surprising thing. But unfortunately, we have seen collapses from her like that before, especially when putting is involved. Kind of reminds me of U.S. women's final round this year. Um, but I, I think this is definitely a bigger Kristen win for a couple of reasons. Number one, she, you know, she's getting back from injury and kind of showing us that she can win again. But after missing the podium in the first two majors of the year, this is kind of what we were looking for from Kristen this year. And um, a lot of players would have easily crumbled after that third round, and, and she did not. 
But I think, you know, regardless of all these things, the true storyline for the FPO field was Silva not winning because she shot five down in the third round and she just needed anything like that in round four. And it kind of makes you wonder if watching the tipping scales between Kristen and Evelina, you know, may have thrown her off a little bit. Those double bogeys on 10 and 12 were really a killer for her. And in round three, she birdied 15, 17 and 18 and she didn't get any of those in round four. And she's, she's young, she's got time to win, but you know she's having some tough sleep over this past weekend. But at the end of the day, I think it's a great win for Kristen. Uh, it looks like last time I checked, she could be skipping Ledgestone and Idlewild. So really, all eyes are on her for the upcoming Worlds to see what she does there. Yeah, I, I do agree. Silva was kind of the forgotten story of that major just because you get so caught up on Evelina and Kristen and forget that, yeah, she really didn't need a ton in that final round to uh, to come away with the win. And that would have been a huge win for her career. Um, Brody, what are your thoughts? Wrap it up for us. So I think this is going to hit home for a lot of people that like to watch college football and occasionally you know, Saturday, 10 o'clock in the morning. There's not really anything on, but there is Mac football on. And you're like, oh, okay, let me just turn this on real quick. And you're very quickly learning like, oh, this is a different sport. Like they're not playing the same sport that I'm going to watch at one o'clock when Texas plays Oklahoma or Alabama plays Auburn. And it is interesting for a small period of time. It is interesting because you don't know what they're going to do. It's kind of almost similar to like college basketball, March Madness, where guys are doing crazy things in like weird moments. Um, I just don't think it has lasting power. That is the only thing. Uh, We saw Kristen have, I would, I I think we're safe to say the worst round we've ever seen her have, especially in a major uh, on that third round. And if you actually watched that round and saw what she was doing, a lot of people are saying, oh, she was bad, had bad luck. No, she played terrible. She threw terrible shots. She missed putts, played terrible. And the fact that she was able to still win this tournament says a lot about the FPO field. And so for FPO, I think to continue to grow and to continue to bring in viewers, the players around it need to get better. Just simple as that. They need to get better. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's kind of what came to mind for me was not necessarily, um, you know, when you have these big swings in FPO division, I think looking at them on paper, you know, at least for a while, like you mentioned, Brody, it's kind of fun, but it becomes this thing where it, it, it lacks, it's not like a cohesive product anymore. When you have these rounds where everybody on the leaderboard can just shift in these huge directions to where it seems like the round before doesn't even necessarily matter because anything can be overcome. You start wondering like what it was even the point of rounds one, two, and three, if round four is really all that's going to matter because the potential there there's like, there's an unpredictability to it, which is nice, but it does get old after a while when you feel like, yes, okay, what is the entire product going well, forward? The, the other thing to add on to that is they had perfect conditions. It was yeah. not windy. It was right. not raining. If it was like really tough and you're like, holy cow, how are they even able to play out there and they're battling? That's one thing. Yeah. But when you're just watching, I mean, heck, Kristen, back-to-back rounds through OB on her layup shot on hole 15. That's, yeah. That is tough to watch. Uh, similar to like, it's like basically Scotty Scheffler topping his tee shot on hole 18 where Sick. everyone's like, wait, what the hap... Imagine if he did that every single tournament, like once or twice around, yeah. you'd be like, bro, what is going on? So to me, it's just like, I think that course fits their style really well. I think Evelina and Missy couldn't win that tournament really without help from everyone else because they just do not have the distance and the shots to be able to birdie as many holes as Evelina, Kristen, some of the farther throwers can. Um, but yeah, it's just, it comes to a point in time where you, I mean, we're seeing it on the MPO side of where they're playing courses where if you make one mistake, all right, that's it. You lost. I mean, we saw from Paul, 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 like was kind of like in it, but you could tell that he knew mentally he Mm -hmm. had lost. He parred like two holes in the first five or six. And he's like, I'm done. I can't win. Yeah. It's a horse race in MPO. A lot of times that final round where, yeah, FPO, you just really never know what's going to happen. And you know, it was a very fascinating experience every morning to wake up and look at the scoreboard and be like, where is that person? Like, I, you're trying to find them on the leaderboard. Like, how, mm-hmm. like, they, they must have gotten injured. Like, where did they go? Um, it, makes me, it makes me wonder sometimes, like, how do you not, I mean, I, I know they're pros and they have their process for doing it, but how does how does Evelina not sit back and go, man, if I just master my putt, if I can just figure this out, Scoop I, I'm going to, scoop? Could be. 
could be scuba that all, all day because like to see her miss like a 20 footer and just airball it wide it's like this is the top this is one of the top performers in our sport like come on let's go yeah. work on that a little bit yeah I, I, yeah i don't know it's between the years the putting game i can't speak on it because i don't have it figured out um all right because we're it's gonna not, move on. last thing too it's not like watching a seven footer trying to shoot a basketball right like shaq mm-hmm. trying to shoot a free throw you're like his hand is too large like yeah. this man is just yeah. too big and it's it's a lot harder for him um making a 20 foot putt shouldn't be challenging if you're five foot tall six foot tall seven foot tall mm-hmm. yeah you think um all right, on to our next topic here. Now, this one, I didn't write it in, but this one was fan submitted. Um, remember to submit those topics. Got a lot of topics last week, so thanks for submitting all of them. So this was a fan submission. Um, this one will hit home for some people. Disc golfers are notorious for long-winded social media posts after tournaments. Many of these posts seem to be used as an opportunity to list excuses for poor performance. Do you think these types of posts do more harm than good for the public perception of a player? Why do you think players utilize them so much? Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, I see him falling a little bit behind in the points. And really, I can only attribute that to unfortunate question design. So that's the first thing. <laughs> but, you know, I think so. The first part of this question, um, how does it affect our perception? I think it kind of depends on how often it's happening, right? Like if you're someone like look at Ricky's post after this event, made no excuses, congratulated Gannon, said it didn't go the way he wished it would have, and he's excited to move on. You're consistently doing things like that and then every once in a while you throw in like oh i had a headache or my knee hurt i think fans will sympathize sympathize with you and the kind of rally behind you in that sense but it doesn't take long to figure out who's doing it over and over again and it just becomes a meme we all know those people um i referenced it obviously in the first one but i mean you never hear someone come off a course and whether you're pros i'm sure brody maybe brody hears it i i've never heard it at an amateur or like local event no one's ever coming off a course saying, man, I'm super lucky to have shot two over today. Like I could have shot 10 over all the trees, like knocking me back in the fairway, like uh, some uh, uh, putts went in that shouldn't have, but like, this isn't just disc golfers. Like negativity bias is one of the biggest, like cognitive flaws we have as people like remembering poor and unlucky things um, more than the lucky things, even if they happen the same amount. And, you know, I, so it is, it's a funny thing, but I, I mean, I just think, it's easier for these pros to make these excuses and look in the mirror, not just pros, of course, look in the mirror and, and, and figure out their actual flaws. And actually want to do a throwback to Dave Felberg had a YouTube video while a long time ago. And he said his secret to playing so well in the middle of a round is always blame it on something else. And he used the example of, if he missed a putt, he literally said, Oh, that squirrel made a noise in my backswing. So like during a round, maybe it makes sense. But afterwards, <laughs> the fact that they're not, looking at it in the mirror actually being honest with themselves it's it's hurting their game in the long run that that's funny i've never heard of that one the dave felberg he's got all the interesting ideas um gary what do you think about these social posts or is it too many excuses you know for me personally i think if you make the decision to step out onto the court the field the course whatever it is you need to stand by your performance that's for me um but that being said these are paid athletes we're talking about so part of the quid pro quo of being sponsored is to post on social media and to be active in that way and event recaps are kind of the most common and easy way to do that i also think after a bad round it's very easy to lean or around you don't feel good about to lean into you know i wasn't feeling great or my putt was off i need to work on my timing or the worst excuse ever which was i couldn't catch a break out there you know that kind of stuff but I think it matters a lot more on like who you are and, and where you finish because when you're sitting tied for 25th, I don't think people are going to really care what your post says most of the time, um, unless you got something groundbreaking to say. But when you finish third at a major and you talk about having a migraine, I think it comes off a bit like saying I would have won. But but in all fairness, the way Paul was wearing his hat made it look like he was absolutely gassed out there. Um, and, and maybe his post should have been looking for a new shoe sponsor because the dude was slipping pretty much everywhere. Um, which honestly is the only excuse I would have tolerated this weekend because some players played without the rain and other players played through a monsoon. And um, I don't think we can really say that these posts are necessarily a good or a bad thing because if they were bad, I think you'd see the top guys stop doing this kind of stuff. You know, if you're elite, you have enough of an audience that it's all good. Because if you look at Macbeth's post, every comment was supporting him all the way, you know, along. And if you're a mid-level player, you're just trying to stay in people's minds some way, shape, or form. Because in the end, it comes down to one thing. If you're a big fan of a player, you see these posts as endearing as, and honest. And if you're not a fan, you're already not a fan. So it doesn't matter. That's a good point. That's a valid point. Could it just be, uh, you was know. This, was this question because of a Macbeth post? Huh? 
I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't I mean, fire I away, Brody. Well, I obviously didn't see it. Um, but that kind of, I think what Gary said at the end is exactly it. Uh, most people that are seeing these posts from the players are fans of that player. We don't have media that is blasting people's posts. Occasionally you'll see stuff. I mean, the Dickerson one that he did for the unfortunate course design, or no, that was uh Joel Freeman. Excuse me. But occasionally you'll see stuff like that get po posted and shared around. But for the most part, these people that are posting this stuff, you know, they can say whatever they want and everyone's going to agree with them and everyone's going to side with them and say, yes, of course, you're the man, you're the best. If that didn't happen, you would have won. And that person's going to probably sit back and look at that and be very happy with themselves. Um, so the question of like, is this good or bad? I don't think it actually changes much of anything. People that are a fan of you. Now, I will say this. We have seen when you go outside of the element, and the, the one that stands out for me is like Paige Pierce here, when she went on another podcast and basically trashed our podcast and tour life, uh, that was some negative feedback. And I've seen that from posts and from YouTube comments and stuff of when she's talking and doing stuff. So I think when you go outside your bubble and you do it, so if Paul would go on, instead of just posting on Instagram, if Paul would go on someone's podcast or do an interview somewhere and be like, oh, I had a migraine or whatever, then I think you would see a little bit of a different pushback. Yeah, that is, that is true. I mean, Last thing, the they're dumb. Just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are absolutely – any post that people make excuses after is just absolutely dumb. To, to, to like the normal sports fan, it's a dumb post. Don't do it. All right. Steven, do you agree? What's your take on these posts? Uh, well, I couldn't hear a word Gary said, and I haven't been able to. So it, I, if I repeat something Gary said, oh. uh, I'm sorry in advance. Um, but to be honest <laughs> – I think Brody's right. They're dumb. I I actually don't read any of them. I see them all the time. I scroll past them. I, I have no desire to read it. I don't care that your, your friend's sister's dog's brother died and you couldn't play the course. Like it, to me, I, I want to see the on course product. I follow your socials because I want to see cool stuff that you do. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear you lament over your round, <clears throat> you know, maybe my algorithm and maybe Brody can correct me, but I don't see a single PGA pro posting anything like this, um, you know, in regards to their tournament. And, and I could be wrong. It could yeah, be my algorithm. Th then I'm wrong. That's fine. That's why I said, I wanted to point to Brody on that one, but I think that having to recap your failures on occasion can be a good thing, but man, to do it after every round, it's gotta do, it's gotta do a number on some of these players psyche. I think they need to find another outlet, whether it's a sports psychologist or something to try and, you know, get those, uh, you know, emotions out after a round, another outlet other than Instagram for it. Uh, but find another thing to post about on your social media, engage your, your, your core fan base with something other than that. And, and I think I would be more engaged with that, with that product as well. I don't think it helps them much to go and post it online. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's funny. And, and you kind of mentioned the outlet thing, but I think the key is if you notice like how quickly these posts happen after rounds, like it's the second they step off the 18th tee. It seems like they're typing these things out. And yeah, if I had a tough round, caught a bunch of bad breaks, and I'm fresh off of that, you best believe my thumbs would start typing some some excuses out there. Like I'd be frustrated. <laughs> I think some people just need to like let it rest for a few hours and okay. then approach it. Cause yeah, I, I mean, and you guys all said it. Like when you're in your own social media bubble, you're posting it, you know what you're gonna get back. Like you're gonna get back that, oh, like keep your head up, like you're the best you know, dang, those, those baskets do suck. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, which yeah. And it, it, like I said, if you're posting about a frustrating round and you're playing at the highest level and nobody's perfect, it, everybody can be susceptible to something like that. I, my favorite, my favorites are when, and we've seen some of this from the, in the past are when you get a, like, I don't want to make any excuses, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> and then you get like, two excuses right after mm -hmm. that. That's, that's my favorite. But, um, you know. I think, uh, yeah, to Mike's point, I think the the athlete that does this the most is fighters. They yeah. have to, if they get knocked out, if they lose, they have to do something to They're mentally the tell fight. themselves, yeah, that that was a fluke and that yeah. would never happen again. The day uh, and they strategy. love saying, they love being like, yeah, I don't want to give any excuses, but, you know, the weight cut was super hard. 
Yeah. And I nearly almost died going into this fight. Yeah, well, and there because like I said, yeah, not only are they trying to help themselves, but they're trying to sell their next fight, get themselves yeah. like but back that's into also, something. But that's also like manhood, right? Two dudes fighting. That's yeah. that's literally like it's I tough. Can't yeah, let you say I can't say that you were better at me and beat me up. Yeah, it's a little to, bit different in disc golf. To I think Brody's, it's okay. To Brody's point on like talking to your own social media audience and kind of being an echo chamber. Let's have mandatory press. Uh, appearances on the tour but when they are having them let's not ask them the three same questions of are you excited to be here how's the course playing are you going to yeah. win this week like let's have them have to ask hard questions and answer hard questions and that way when someone does say something really stupid or make excuses everyone including their fans and their non-fans see it and we can make fun of them about it yeah that's yeah, not gonna right. happen it would never happen <laughs> if i listen man if, if they if i could fly around and be the guy that everybody hates to ask the annoying media questions i'd do it yeah I'd, everyone you know, wants to everyone wants to be friends no one wants to offend anyone yeah, yeah. like it's like people asking the questions from the media on the on the dg like, the microphone and they literally the go and have lunch with the players afterwards <laughs> yeah. like what like, it's just not it, i mean it, and, and it's tough like you have to be you have to be you know, cutting through cutthroat enough as a media member that the best players will just respect you for doing your job well. You know, at the end of the day, that's what you have to be, mm -hmm. but that's a whole nother take. <laughs> no one's gonna um, ask Ricky, hey, it's been uh, seven years since you've won a major and you just you pulled that that wide right. Yeah. Uh, what are you feeling right now? Yeah, or yeah. <laughs> or or hey, you said you didn't win because you had a migraine. What what do you have to say about like Michael Jordan playing with the flu? Which one do you think <laughs> is which one do you think is more difficult? Playing disc golf with a headache or playing basketball with a flu? Well, mm -hmm. you know, Brady, it wasn't just great this morning. Man. You got to read the post. It wasn't just. Do you remember Terrell Owens? He broke his leg and still playing in the Super Bowl. Yeah. What are we talking about here? <laughs> it wasn't just a headache, man. Calm down. There's a lot I, I'm not going to be able to see the post, so <laughs> you can maybe screenshot and send it to me. I don't even know if I want to encourage that, but I'm yeah, like, I, don't, um, I actually don't care either. Way. <laughs> his that is what is progressively it, higher throughout the round. It. it genuinely was a. Uh, fan submitted topic but but that was probably what spurred it because like and somebody mentioned you know i don't ever read these posts either except when somebody loses a tough one and then i want to hear what they have to say because you know you just know you're going to get some gold like no player is coming out of there and, and scotch free like they're always going to drop a little nugget of something like oh i didn't tie my shoes tight enough that day or i didn't eat the right breakfast it's just you know disc well, and, those into posts. that and to that shout out i mentioned it but shout out to ricky like Absolutely zero excuses. Just said yeah. it didn't go how you wanted to, and he's yeah, excited for the next one. I don't read enough of these to have a huge gauge on things, but I wouldn't say Ricky's a huge excuse guy, and that's my – Oh, yeah, definitely not. That's my I perception. He's not had an excuse. He shut the course record. Yeah, <laughs> tough for him to even – yeah, but he definitely could have said something like – and I didn't read his post, but he definitely could have said, trees. I got an awful break on 18, yep. you know? And he he had every right, right to say that. He would have been right to say that, yeah. too. Yeah, he did have an awful stage. break. Um. Yeah, and there's also a stage right off. No, like, you can't uh, say that about the stage. The <laughs> stage, the stage Everyone is had there. it there for all the practice rounds. We, we all knew it was there. You can't say that about the stage. You can say about no, the No, it wasn't trade. a bad break. It's, yeah, you know. Um, all right, last topic for the finals. Um, so we have just one event left with the Beast course until it is removed. It will no longer be played. Um, so I just want to know, are you sad to see it go or do you think the tour has outgrown it? And if you do think the tour has outgrown it, was the property maxed out or did it just need some tweaks? What are your thoughts on the property, Gary? You know, if you had asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, I think I would have had a slightly different answer, but because of the beast is the icon is an icon of the sport. It's a place that I've always wanted to play at. And despite all that, I think this course represents the changing of an era in disc golf, you know, when placed side by side with the monster, it became even more apparent this past weekend because on its own, I think the beast has a place because who doesn't like watching rounds that are dead sprints and like birdie fest can certainly be fun. However, I don't think it represents the growth of the sport and where it's going. And the monster kind of comes into play there because it's the course that it feels like we're moving towards. Um, and it, you know, there's an ever increasing talent pool in disc golf that has to be challenged. And the beast just isn't doing that anymore. One point of credit that I will give it is that it does have a, decent finishing stretch, even though they took the legs out of hole 16, the last three holes do create drama. I mean, look what happened to Ricky and Silva on 18, but the monster is going to need to think about that going forward as something for their own design. But the other thing is you need to step back and look at what European disc golf is. Cause it's a little bit different than American disc golf. And you know, what we've seen in events leading up to that this year is that it's got beautiful landscapes and breathtaking course design. And the beast oddly enough feels like the least European of all the venues that we go to. And the monster, you know, was hand designed to be spectacular. At one point on covers, they talked about course designers using modeling clay to demo landscapes before they were created and running material underground to help with drainage. So I think next year, 
it's going to be an emotional send-off to a historic course. And for the sport to grow, we just need to move on from it. But the thing is, we need to hope that the uh, venues in the U.S. see this transition and take notes about it because this is how we move the sport forward in disc golf. Yeah, definitely seems like a great uh, place to move with the the monster course. Uh, Brody, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, looking at the last couple of European events and, and the new course on the European Open, this one definitely seems more of like, oh, it's just you're playing in a park. Um, you know, and other than the drone views of the city and stuff, you wouldn't really be able to tell where you're playing. Now, I, I do think the course has been outgrown in the MPO side. I think it's a, actually a phenomenal course in the FPO side. Um, and the example I want to give too is like hole 18, for example, the way that the inbounds is up that hill for FPO to lay up. Um, like that wouldn't exist if MPO was playing that course solely by themselves. So I think for it to actually work, I think you would have to do quite a bit of tweaking for the MPO, but by doing that, it would basically limit the FPO from playing there. So it's kind of like this one things of like, do you do where, do you do it where like the FPO plays Tampara and MPO plays that layout and then you switch it. And so the FPO can play there. Does that make sense? Like, so the, they need it. It's too hard right now to make a really good course for MPO and FPO on the same course. Um, but looking at, you know, the two courses, I'm going to disagree with Gary here. I don't, I don't know for a major. I don't love the idea of a birdie fest. I love the idea of someone maybe being able to shoot 10 under and just have an absolute incredible day. But like watching Ricky and Gannon play that course, I never thought in my head, like, holy cow, these guys are throwing incredible shots. It's just they were getting off the disc, they were getting off the tee clean and then throwing 200-foot up shots and making the putt. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that the um, the downfall of the beast probably comes in the shorter par fours where it's like if you're off the tee, you're basically golden. Um, Steven, what are your thoughts on these on the, uh, the beast? Uh, yeah, you know... Uh, obviously it's probably been said already by Gary. Of course I can't hear him, but Cole 16 for me, obviously everyone's talked about it already a thousand times, but it's a joke now. Um, and I think that just highlights the fact that the tour is outgrowing that course. Um, having a boat race on the course, uh, for birdies is, is tough. It's, it, I mean, it can be electric, but it, it's really not, you, you want to see some, you know, mental fortitude be displayed when you're, when you're out there grinding for a major championship, uh, you know, watching Ricky and Gannon go on six whole birdie streaks, seven whole birdie streaks, whatever it is. It's like, there's, there's no challenge in that. Um, you know, yes, it's hard to do. You still got to make the shots, but, uh, you got to see something, you got to see something more than that. I think there was, from my calculation, there was only two holes that had less than a 30% birdie rate um, through uh, rounds three and four on the beast. And so you're basically getting a third of the holes where, uh, you know, a th- I mean, uh, excuse me, 16 holes where a third of the field is birdieing those holes. It, it's becoming too easy. In my opinion, the one thing that the beast has that, not a lot of other places have is the infrastructure. That is the one thing I'll say. If they can find another property and provide it the infrastructure that the Beast has with the grandstands, with the monitors available for you at the uh, tournament central area, you know, just the overall fanfare that comes with the European Open at the Beast when you see 5,000 people lining the fairway of hole 18 and up in the stands, I mean, that creates excitement that you can market around as the Pro Tour. And if you're going to go away from the beast you need to find a property that can support that tamper or however you pronounce it it, it doesn't have that and, and so you're gonna have to find a property that you can transfer that over to no that's a very good point that's a very good point you can say what you want about majors but um as much as they kind of show off the huge crowd that rolls in there like you do have to have the imp- infrastructure to support that that's something that like for example winthrop it might not be the most scenic course ever but it has the infrastructure to take on huge crowds. And that's a big part of the equation when you have an event that you know can draw those crowds. So that's a good point. Uh, Mike, wrap it up for us. What do you think about the beast? Um, Sad to see it go? Yeah, I mean, definitely sad to see it go in general. My first memories of like falling in love with disc golf is the Spin TV YouTube videos at European Open. I mean, some of those are the most iconic uh, tournaments ever, at least in my memory. Um, You know, I think it held up pretty well over the past, you know, 10 or so years. If you look back at old rounds, obviously the course is quite a bit different than it was then, but 
it still has kind of had similar hot rounds around that 10, 11 um, vicinity. So I think it's done a good job of adjusting over time. That being said, I do think it's kind of at its peak. I'm not sure that there's a lot more you can do. Um, but also I want to point out that there's plenty of other courses. Um, Worlds aside, it's kind of a different conversation if you want a course like this at Worlds, but there's plenty of courses on tour that 10, 11, 12 under is the typical hot round. And so like, if we're keeping those courses and we don't have anything better at the moment, like I would have liked to have this one around still just for the infrastructure, how many people are coming out there, how beautiful the course looks. So I, I think it could have stayed around, but it, it makes sense that um, people are feeling that way about it. Uh, I do want to point out that, you know, this is a really good talking point and reason to really focus on disc golf first properties between this, between Winthrop, you know, there's always rumors of not, us not having Winthrop forever. Like it's ever more important to have places that are only disc golf or at least disc golf focused because the fact that Ricky's never going to get a chance to win an event or not going to get more chances to win an event at the European Open, like with that um, monkey on his back, like it just ruins the tradition and stuff of our of our sport. And we really need to focus on having events at places we can have for the long haul. Yeah, I'd say the sooner we can have um you know courses locked in at least for majors that are operating that way the better um i do i do think it was probably time for kind of a retirement for that course i feel like it 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 gets to a point with certain disc golf properties where you get too far into this modern era and they almost get blemished a little bit um you know it's like it's like if we if we had modern baseball players playing at stadiums from the 1800s with you know 250 foot fences like and it's Metal even different bats. in golf or, or it's like in golf if they just hadn't edited certain golf courses like augusta to make them more challenging you know mm -hmm. you, you you diminish a course by you know letting it go too long and um it would just be remembered differently like already the beast when certain new fans remember it they'll think oh the beast that wasn't you know, I wasn't super hard course. It was pretty scoreable out there, you know? Uh, like, I'm not really sure why they called it the beast. You know, it, that's kind of the way the sport's gone. Yeah. And I just want to add one thing before I get booted here. I didn't get an opportunity to say it, but the commentary this weekend was fantastic. I was oh, a agree to disagree. A lot of people oh. like it. A lot of people didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. It was, I thought that's, it was great. That's fine. It's good. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't. Yeah. Um, it was pretty split. One, it's than you. one, one question. Um, that I'm always curious why is never asked. We we on that course, for example, we always talk about hole 15, 16, 17, and 18. Yeah. We're never talking about like hole eight, the 260 foot hole up the hill. We're never talking about like hole nine. We're never talking about like hole one, which is just like a 280 foot shot. Yeah. What if we built a course that instead of just having four holes that we talk about? Yeah. What if that was the entire course? Mm -hmm. What if from hole one, you had to think and you had to make decisions and you had to throw tough shots? Hey, you're not wrong. I uh, I actually tweeted out a little while ago because I had noticed that being a trend with a lot of disc golf courses that courses get picked out because people it, it, it started because people came to New London and New London. If you've played it, it doesn't necessarily have a hole that sticks out at you because it no. goes over a pond or something. You know, that's what a lot of times disc golf courses that they're all about the scenery for people. Um, but it doesn't have one that jumps out at you as a signature hole, but the, the course is tough through and through like there's there. New London does not have any gimme holes and um, people were kind of coming after it. So I kind of tweeted out. I was asking people, you know, what are some disc golf courses that you feel like get way overrated just because of a few signature holes? And there was hundreds of replies. And I think that happens a lot because. You know, you go on U disc and you see a few pictures of a scenic shot over water or off of a mountain, and you're like, this course rocks. And it's like, does it, or is there a few good holes that make it like notable to people? How yeah. many there? I don't really think there are a lot of courses out there that really one through 18. And, and it's tough. I think where it happens most of the time is because you have these park properties and you're trying to follow a flow that is set for you. Mm -hmm. And people will always get to a point at some point in the round where like, well, we just need to get from here to he here to here. This is what we have to work with. It's just going to be a filler hole. It, there's not a lot of people that are going out and being like, okay, we are going to terraform and transform this property to match every hole how we want it to be. And um, that's definitely a thing. That's, that's a good a point. Uh, it, back in, in uh, 2023, I did a thing where I thought about what my dream 18 was on every course I've ever played. And yeah. I, it was amazing how I would pick a hole on a course and I wouldn't really like much else of that course. Yeah. It was just one hole that stuck out. And we kind of go back to like 
the discussion that, you know, we had about Des Moines a little bit. And there weren't a lot of holes at Des Moines that were like iconic, but as a whole, the course was really, yeah. really great. It's you really you may not have one hole that's like, that's my favorite hole there of, of all time, but the course as a whole was elevated because of it. So yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's a really interesting point. And one of the other points that I really liked was, um, I think uh, Steve and Mike kind of both brought it up was, as we kind of move on to these new courses, one of the things that we can't miss is how do we take the popularity of the attendance at the beast and how do we translate that into these other courses while also not losing the difficulty that we want to have added to those courses and like the picturesqueness and all that kind of stuff. Because if one thing the beast really did well, it maximized, I think, uh, the experience of the people on the course, the spectators. Totally. Yeah. Your experience was, was no doubt great. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, having a disc, uh, you know, I watch all, I always watch every single hole of like the courses before we preview events to refresh myself on a course. I'll, I'll watch practice rounds and whatever. And it's not often that I get to a course and every single hole will be interesting to me. Like usually there'll be at least some patch on the course where I'm like, oh, it's just kind of a hole, you know, oh, it's a simple par three, not a lot of thought to that. Um, but it's, it's difficult to put together a complete property life. Comment down below. What do you feel like are the most complete disc golf courses, one through 18, where at least maybe, 16 or 17 of those holes are, are really thought provoking, um, holes and, and not a lot of filler. Cause I would say in our area, new London is one like that. There's, there's not any holes that are just, um, filler in my opinion, unless you remove the OB from them. Mm -hmm. Thanks PDGA. Um, <laughs> that's a whole different thing. <laughs> Why did they do it? Um, all right. On to the finals. Uh, Gary got a pretty big lead on Brody. Anything can happen, but we'll see what happens here. At least we're going to get both your takes. Uh, would you like to go first or second? I'll go first on this one. All right. So European Open utilized a mock pay-per-view model via the DGN. Now, I said mock pay-per-view because obviously it was not pay-per-view technically, but it might as well have acted that way because it basically had most members paying an upgrade fee that they would probably cancel after the event. Um, so it required customers to have a pro membership to view. Do you think this was a wise move? And do you think pay-per-view has a place in our sport in any capacity? What do you think about that strategy, Gary? You know, I think there's so many things that we can harp on the tour and the PGA for. I mean, for example, where were half the player stats in rounds one and two this weekend? I guess we're just not going to get those. Um, but I don't think I've ever seen such a divided line over something, at least not in my recent memory. I've I've seen post after post about like the money grubbing DGN and PDGA and paying for live inferior products is just ridiculous. And I'm just going to cancel my subscription anyway. And then after the events over, those same people are like, oh, spoiler warning, spoiler warning. And they shame other people for paying for the event to see it. I mean, honestly, listen, if you don't have the money, that's understandable. I'm never going to judge someone for not having the money to pay for something. But a lot of people knew about this in advance. And if you managed it right, you could have gotten this event for a prorated cost. I mean, a lot of people paid like $2 for this event. And ask yourself this question, was the European Open of 2024 worth $2? Yeah, it was. I mean, I feel like most of the people complaining about this were just kind of upset that they found out about the outcome and they didn't get to see it live and see something great. I mean, here, even if the even if the PDGA and the DGPT are companies, and even if they are trying to make money, and even if they are messing around with the subscription model a little bit, money is what pushes this sport forward in the long run. And we talked about this a few weeks ago on here that no subscription money means less operating fund. And less operating fund means you know, more losses and lower event quality, lower event quality means less eyes, less eyes mean less sponsors and no sponsors means this whole thing tanks. The sponsors are, are required. It's not a perfect product yet. I think they're taking steps to get there, but you know, never mind the fact that people pay triple and quadruple for other things in their life that make no sense. You could literally have watched the European open by not buying one can of Pepsi this month. I mean, as it stands for the future of pay-per-view models, I think it can work if certain things are met. I mean, you've got to price it correctly. It's got to be communicated to consumers well in advance. I think that um, post-produce shouldn't be too far out from the event and it needs to be held to a higher standard, more cameras, give people better commentary, keep the courses pristine. The money talks. If enough people pay for it, it's how it's going to work. And if you don't like it, just wait for post-produce. But the sport's young in the eyes of the media and things are getting figured out. But welcome to the growing pains of any sport. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I always find the, you know, the inferior product thinks funny because it's a live product. It's, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's part of the product. It's not just like you're comparing post and live based on their image quality and graphics. Like one of them is live. And one of them is post. Uh, Brody, what do you think about the pay-per-view model? Obviously, big UFC guy. So you're very familiar with it. Yeah, I, I wonder 
I wonder what the numbers were. Because I think in this question, for us to really answer it, it would have to be number-based. Because I think there's two t- – DGN, Disc Golf Pro Tour, PDJ, whoever it is, there's two ways of going about it, right? It's either – Let's charge the people that are currently interested in disc golf and slowly try to grow that way. Or let's make it as free as possible to try to get as big of as many eyes as possible. And then we can take those numbers to someone and have them pay with sponsorships and commercials and all that stuff. Um, I think there's two ways of going about it. And I don't think they really have come up with what they want to do. It seems like they kind of are bouncing back and forth and testing it, which honestly probably is the way to do it. Now, the interesting interesting thing with the pay-per-view model is, you know, in a UFC fight or a boxing match, you basically don't cap yourself. If you sell the rights to someone and say, hey, we will let you put this on CBS or NBC or whatever, and it's we're going to charge you a million dollars, you basically have that fee. And if you feel like you're going to have some events do really, really well and maybe even do more than that, then you're probably better off doing the pay-per-view model, right? If you are thinking, hey, Conor McGregor is going to come back and fight, you know, we can sell $70 worth of paper. We could sell 100,000 of these things and make quite a lot of money more than if we sell the rights completely. So there's definitely two ways of going about it. I think the one thing that kind of hurt a lot of people is just like the time difference. It would have been really interesting to see if the time difference, uh, you know, they've done this at USDGC. I don't think there was as much pushback because people were able to watch everything. You know, Mm -hmm. paying for a product that you're not even really watching half of it, it's probably a little bit tough for uh, some people to swallow. Yeah, and I I think at the end of the day, probably what makes people – the most upset about this and what they did was the fact they did it through the upgrade model. It wasn't like you just yeah. you know, bought a purchase. So they were, they, they, and everybody knows this about the subscription, you know, business strategy, but they're trying to get you to forget you upgraded. You know, there's 100%. no, se- there's no secret there. I'm sure their next month's top line is going to look better because of the people that upgraded. And I'm sure it was a lot. I'm sure they were drooling at that lead card, knowing that, Whoever upgraded maybe from round one on, I'm sure those numbers were tripled um, right before round four because people wanted to see that happen. Um, I'm not sure but- that is accurate, but I did see someone say that they they said that they were going to remind people to cancel after the event. Mm-hmm. Um, really? And- well, it's, it's, you know, I mean, that, that would be the fair thing to do is like, hey. Well, I, I would well, just be let- surprised if they did that. Th- that's, th- again, I'm, I'm only going off of what someone said yeah. me. Um, but to be in, you know, kudos to them, if that's what they were going to do of like, Hey, we're going to just let you guys know, maybe it's not, Hey, cancel, but maybe let people know like, Hey, if you want to continue on your pro membership, great, you know, whatever. And apparently they did not do that. (laughs) Well, that's even funnier because it's like. If they were to do that, they're basically saying, like, you don't want to still be a pro member. Trust me. Like, this is the reason why you wanted it. Like, go ahead and downgrade. Like, you know, you see the, on their YouTube channel, they put the last three holes up of the MPO. Oh, did they? Up on their YouTube. So, like, if you just want to go watch the last three holes, mm-hmm. kind of post produced cut style, you can go do that. And that was posted yeah. only like a day and a half after the event was over. I, I think we're all in agreement at this point to where there's endless strategies they could try and employ, but they're 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 protecting their they're protecting the, the treasure chest. You know, they do they do not want to lose their subscriptions. Um, you know that that's the most revenue they're getting out of anything is coming from that. So they ha- they have to hold that close to the chest, and it would can be can they wild- stop paying money for all these other things? Can I just say that? Can they just do live? Oh, instead of like the other. Well, I don't know how much they actually spend on the other things. Well, I know some of the things. What do you mean? They're 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 having people fly. They're editing these things for months. Like, yeah. I I think most people just want live. I would agree with you on that one. I I think that it would be really interesting to see if they had an angel donor who was like, "Hey, I'm going to cover. You know, I'm going to cover an amount. Uh, I'll cover losses. Let's try out a new pay per view model. Let's try out a new stream model. Let's let's make it more free. What would live disc golf do if we just took one event or a few events every year and made them completely free? And it, and it was every single round all free. Like then they could at least get a gauge on what the potential could look like. Um, but it, it, you know, they're staying where they're comfortable right now, and I, I think that's just been the consensus at this point. Um, It'd yeah, be like interesting I, to see. 
Like we don't we don't need a Brody documentary that they spend fifty thousand dollars to put behind a play paywall and would you try sign to get a, new members? Sounds like a good deal for you. What's that? Fifty thousand dollars sounds like a great deal for no, you. No, no, no. I'm, saying, I'm saying they spend fifty thousand dollars <laughs> on making it. Yeah. The dark horse difference. I the think I think I think right now they haven't decided what they want DGN to be. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they're having all these different shows and they're having like post post shows. Uh, pre-shows, all this. I mean, they had those two dark horse people in some green room and who knows what basement somewhere for a few weeks. Um, <laughs> and so I just think if they, if they could just figure out what works and was like, hey, let's just do that, they would stop wasting money and maybe not having to try to get people to forget to downgrade their subscriptions. Yeah, yeah. There's a, it's, it's very interesting. I Man, I'd love to sit in those meetings, see what's going through their head. Um, you Gary, you're meetings? Ch- yeah, just like their strategy meeting. <laughs> oh, is there meetings? Yeah, might not be. Yeah, exactly. Maybe like a phone call here and there. I don't know. Who Let's knows run it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it. It's just everybody says yes, and then they just do it. Um, Gary, you're a champ tonight. Congratulations. I feel like it was right because you're kind of our European correspondent. Even though you're not European, you seem to really stick up for them. So it, it feels right that you won after the European Open. Yeah, it was a it was a great weekend of disc golf to watch. Uh, th- this is this is a great hype up because in three days I'm getting ready to drive out to Illinois for Ledgestone to play in it. So nice, ooh, good luck, brother. It's a good time. I, yeah, I'm playing I'm playing the MA one in that one. So I get Northwood Black, Sunset Hills, and Wildlife, and uh, you wildlife. know, bro, bro, brother, you need a you need a caddy for Thursday. You let me know, brother. Um, but I'm playing. Are the, you gonna be out there Thursday? Yeah, I'm playing the Flex event uh, at Eureka Temp on Sunday. I've played that course a few times, but Thursday we don't compete on. We only compete Friday through. Sunday, so Thursday we have not much going on. Oh, sounds nice. like a deal. Yeah, yeah. let's Good rock time. and roll. Um, well, gosh, Gary, well, best of luck to you. I hope you know we will be tracking your scores adamantly now, and <laughs> right. uh, probably right. putting them up in big text on the next episode. <laughs> this is what Gary shot at Northwood Black. It's going to be there. Um, so, best of luck to you. Don't be thinking about that. I wouldn't want you to think about that as you're lining up a 25 footer. Oh, but well. just yeah, don't <laughs> think about it. Um, (laughs) um, Hey, that should be a great time though. Haven't been out there yet. Uh, great episode again, everybody, uh, make sure to submit more topics to the show. We love getting them. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. And isn't it great to have Silas back, man, after that stagnant last episode, shout out Silas, (laughs) all those moving pictures. That's him every time. Um, and if we ever decide to go live, it'll be even more so him. Um, Shout out Anthony Richards. Why is it always that card? Or you just pull him all the time? What like, I don't understand. I just pulled this today. Gosh, man. That was today? Yeah, I just pulled, I just pulled this today. Is that for real? I mean, it like two hours. Okay, ago. well, I just like, I feel like it's a bit that you just keep getting Anthony Richardson's. Has there been like three or four of them? Do you know how many cards I open? <laughs> a lot. By here, the, sure, here, let me see. Here, we'll just do a quick one. Here you go. There's a pink one. Stroud. Well, that's not Anthony Richardson. <laughs> Anthony Richardson in blue. Mythical Bryce Young. Uh, Rookie Kings DTR. And my boy. That's my quarterback, AOC. That's a bummer. Raiders 11 and 7 this year. <laughs> 11 and 7. 11 and 7 I don't this year. I think there's that many games. Uh, I believe there's 18 games. No, there's 18 weeks, 17 games. I thought they were going to 18 games. Are they not 18 games? It's in talks. They're maybe talking about it. (laughs) (laughs) If they go 11 and seven, that means they either won or lost their first. Well, it probably means they lost the first round of playoffs. That's their total record for the season. So, hey, congratulations on making the playoffs. And we'll see you next week, everybody. (laughs) When are they going 18 games?